Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Lena Brzozowska, and I'm welcoming a new guest for a new podcast from Australia again. I had a couple other guests from Australia, and I love conversation with Australian guests because they're always unique and interesting. And um, um, I would I would like to introduce you, uh, Jenna Mikus, and let me tell her about her tell about her a little bit more but hi Jenna hi nice to see you hello nice to see you too Elena it's nice that you have morning I have late evening but we can talk and actually we're going to discuss a very interesting topics so uh, Jenna is a global expert in transformative health and well-being design and sounds really intriguing so we're going to talk about this a partner educate group with a visiting fellow for uh, QUT, and uh, also she uh, designed, she created like, you know, the technique or methods of designing for health, well-being and new strategies and innovation in psychology. And she has experience, um, at, least, at least like 20 years of experience working in psych in psychology and psychological field which is amazing and if you want to know more about um my wonderful guests just scroll down the video and information about the video you will see some links to uh, jenna's profile and website so you can learn about her more and if you need to help please uh, free uh, feel feel welcome to contact her and then actually ask a question. So hi, Gina, nice to see you. Yes. And yes, you as well. And um, looking through your specialization, as I always say, like my guests are always unique because they specialize in something that nobody did before and learning uh, a lot from uh, different sources. And we are learning from like this people like you and this is amazing and I uh, paid attention on uh, interesting like word combination uh, like when you says that you're expert in transformative health and well-being design which sounds like I understand what the, what, what it means but still uh, it's something new and in transformation what I really accept I know that we need time to be to change like you know to be changed because usually people think that it's so simple like today you feel negative emotions and then tomorrow you woke up and you start thinking positive and then you're talking to yourself think positive think positive everything fine everything fine <laughs> but then you get tired and then i'm lying to myself nothing is fine i'm not happy but this right. is what happened um mostly when we deal with coaches that copy each other and telling you that oh it's so simple you just like felt bad and then you switch to felt good but i said no 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 it's like recovery like in in, in the medicine disease takes time to be healed and recover it and treat it so it's it's a transformation time and it's like it's not just like one minute or one day uh like time and uh, or period that's why i understand that you really look through the period when we transform in ourselves and this time could be different so i'll give you the word tell us more about this transformation design of course and um yeah it's kind of probably helpful to take a step back first and talk a little bit about my background and how i approach the work because it is quite unique and not necessarily psychological. It uh, only recently became a little bit more focused on positive psychology. So um, I began with doing mechanical engineering and wow. did change management consulting straight out of uni. So, and I went to school in America. I'm originally from the US, but I just recently finished my PhD in Australia where I am now. So my first decade of work experience was in consulting because I always took on the role of management, having that kind of uh, stepped back broader view of the project and making sure it was delivered on time and making sure the team worked together to accomplish the goals of that, you know, oftentimes very scientific approach and to design. And I really enjoyed the work. I liked the challenge of working with different clients to solve problems. But I was working with the federal government in America and Australia. And while it was fun to have the challenges of those different projects. 
I wanted to be able to do it in a field that I was really passionate about. And it wasn't until I came to Australia and worked at the Australian tax office and saw a building that was so sustainable and an environment that just made people feel happy to be there that I thought, you know, I've always really enjoyed architecture. It speaks to me. Blueprints are really natural for me to understand. Maybe I will go back to my engineering roots and go in a more architectural direction. And I chose to do a master's degree that was about sustainable design because sustainability is so key. And I learned the importance of occupants because that was always something I like to emphasize as people. And that's not something that a lot of architects per se emphasize. They enjoy looking at the building, even showing pictures of a beautifully drawn or depicted building, but you rarely see people shown in those. And so I really wanted to have a design approach that would emphasize the people, involve the people. And so my second decade of experience was applying that architectural understanding for the built environment, but making sure the people were included and involved in the process. So I transitioned over into that and started going more towards that technology route because there was a lot happening in the 2010s around smart buildings and whatever that would entail. And I really enjoyed the challenge, again, working with people to accomplish something in spaces that would be fun experiences, things like that, that they needed to do their day-to-day -day job or just enjoy their homes. But towards the end of my work, it was becoming very technified. And around that time, also the International Well Building Institute was starting and this Well AP accreditation certification was coming about. And so I was there when that was initially pitched in Washington, DC back around 2014 or so. And I became a well AP myself and my smart clients started asking me about how do you design for health and well-being in spaces? And I was like, you know, I'm actually learning up on that myself. Let's learn together. And I started my own UDA group and mm -hmm. uh, decided to do a PhD. And so when you think about transformation, I had always approached it from the change management point of view for that first decade of my experience, understanding how to do changes in an organization in a stepped way, in an iterative way. But then later on, when I started learning about health and well-being, I came across Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia and thought, you know, we do so much design futuring work in the built environment. I think designing for eudaimonia would be an excellent way of having people design for their best selves and giving them an idea of what to achieve and what to strive for. And so that's when I started the Uta group, which is all based mm -hmm. on eudaimonia and began a PhD on eudaimonic design. It's an amazing story, and it usually like people with uh, technical degree, engineering, let's say, uh, they more dry. Uh, it's uh, not the right probably description, but they concentrating on environment where they deal with mechanisms, with plants, with uh, like whatever you you name, right? At the same time, they separate people from this environment they work, and even architectures. Whatever they build, they they concentrate attention on. A beauty of the design, like you know, this is like house uh, or uh, let's say some business building, doesn't matter. And they hardly think about comfort for people. They are mostly looking for beauty of the structure and then how the structure can be built through new technologies, etc. That's what I found because even I subscribe to some architects like you know, design, like who's designing the 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 houses, you know because they like to see the beauty, how it looks like on, on a screen and an image, yeah. Uh, but then I was thinking, but is it safe? Is it like convenient for people, even like driver, whatever? But then you start thinking, would you like to live in this house? Would you like to live in this environment? And not always I feel comfortable, you know, even if the window was beautiful. But you, you actually uh, never separated yourself from people because management is management of the team you're dealing with, it's people, right? It's not a technical process, it's management mostly like, you know, even if the, the technical process included. Uh, but you back because uh, now you you we work more on um, psychological level because you start understanding people who work in any environment in, which is uh, beautiful. It's, it's like you care about people. No wonder that you 
start coming back to uh, designing. And again, you use a lot of words that comes from uh, like science, like technical science, because right because design let's say or uh structure or uh any like i was reading like you about your work what you were doing it's and like you see it's, it's clearly it's like a scheme a method or it's like you know something solid not just like uh you know blah 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 it's like your uh, vision of the structure uh of the services you are providing and um uh, Again, you're building like architecture. You're adding something to your approach to people and their, your programs and program of design. And some, some actually people are afraid the word design and uh, because they think it's something like somebody has to do from outside, right? Usually we, we not. But you, uh, your uh, main point, it's uh, design architecture of not so it's all it's like you know very kind of like diluted meaning but i mean uh of personality from inside right and yes uh, exactly and that that's you talking about self-growth about how to find your strengths how to be the best from your point of view not your but the person's point of view because again uh it's building from inside when and when you do not order like what they have to do like you don't tell them you have to do this and then but you ask them to look inside and find more about yourself and uh like design it's a little bit different but it sounds beautiful you know and i was uh, reading and i found very interesting topic that and you mentioned already uh, and you did mention the fact that it's always been people related for my work and i think mm -hmm. that's because mm -hmm. Maybe the inner engineer in me likes understanding how things are done. And so oftentimes work is approached from the mechanics of how rather than the people and the role that they play. So, yeah, I thought that that was very important. And eudaimonia really nods to that reference. And that's what I found so empowering about using it as a term and as a goal, because with eudaimonia, it's oftentimes discussed and compared to happiness, but I feel that that does a disservice to the word. And if you really get into the positive psychology and the well being science background of the term, it's oftentimes seen more as a being your best self. Yes. Rele relevant term and uh, adjacent term. And I quite like that description of it. And that's really what I used when I was describing it within my PhD with participants so that it was something that was recognizable and relatable. And when you think about it in that way, I started thinking also that it could be used to parallel um, health. And so it's not just about eudaimonic well-being as mm -hmm. one of the well-beings with subjective, psychological, et cetera, that have been studied very extremely with extreme rigor also in positive mm -hmm. psychology. Mm -hmm. But I really enjoyed looking at it for its health benefits because so much was happening again in built environment about how you design for health and specifically how you design for the three aspects of health, physical, social, and mental. And very little had been talked about a few years ago about how to design for health collectively for all three of those elements. It was always, and there's excellent science behind this now for architectural science, neuroarchitecture, which is a relatively new field, and then yeah. now bridging well-being science. Those just hadn't really been combined all that much. And that's really what I strove to do. And so eudaimonia, I wanted to try out with a model I created is that something that by designing for self-determination theory, which is a means for eudaimonia, according to DC and Ryan and a variety of other positive psychologists, could that potentially be used as a means to design for physical, mental, social health? Mm -hmm. And so within my, my PhD, that's something that we explored. And people were able to understand the concrete relevance and benefit that they could get health-wise from that, but then also the feelings that they could have by having a eudaimonic well-being sort of experience in their space. And with that, the emphasis became not only on the output of the curated design space itself, but also on the feelings people got by doing that work and designing for eudaimonia. People were experiencing that intrinsic motivation, which wasn't really something I was testing. It was an unexpected benefit. So participants who, in my case, I worked with older adults living alone in Australia, 
they were reporting back to me saying, you know, when I did the photography exercise at home, I noticed that a corner of my room would really benefit from some biophilia, you know, or having that outside brought in. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. my kids and I had a lovely conversation about it. It encouraged connection among us and they bought me a plant. And other people said, you know, I I started deciding that I wanted to tidy up my house. And, um, you know, that really motivated me to do something I had been putting off for years. So just stories like that were being recounted to me. And that's when I realized eudaimonic design of that term that I had created was more than just the physical aspect of design and the output. It was about the process itself and the praxis if it was done intentionally and meaningfully. And that's what I really liked. It's beautiful, and I I totally agree with you that we are not uh, just uh, human beings. We we kind of a complex um, creatures, <laughs> say right, that actually uh, have this um, absolutely different perception of everything that surrounds us and our environment, and plus our feelings, and um, um, building like you know the comfort around like herself or our family members or whatever, even environment at work, right? It's always uh, not just physical brain plant, let's say, but it's also has uh, some psychological and reacts on our, like, you know, uh, eyes. And uh, anyway, it gives different emotions. And um, I, I found that when people say to be the best, like you have to be the best of you, of yourself, uh, it's, it sounds scary in a way that nobody knows exactly what is the best of yourself. And then again, in different periods of time, uh, we can feel differently. And even yes. if it comes to, to some kind of work, let's say I was planning to do uh, some work today and I failed in some way. I didn't finish what I wanted to finish because um, I was painting a little bit and then the paint went all over the kitchen. So I had to clean for one hour and a half because it's like, you know, it was my mistake. Uh, but mm-hmm. again, so I, I had to clean and I was thinking, okay, so it means I didn't finish what I want to do. It wasn't my best, but then I was thinking, but under some circumstances and what happened, it's not my fault that this has happened. Sometimes it happens, even because you don't plan bad things uh, to happen. And I said, actually, I did my best. Because I did mm-hmm. this, I did that, I did exactly. that. I did a lot, like you know. And I'm recording the podcast, so I'm not sleeping, and not watching TV. <laughs> yes, uh, so I'm doing my best, right? And also my my all hands and my arms actually, not just hands, uh, in pain that I cannot remove. So I have to use a special kind. So that's why I'll do- <laughs> you've had quite a day. Yes. <laughs> And they sent picture to my friends. They look what how like like look. It's funny, like you know, I will in 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 the spots, but it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going anywhere, and I'm wearing like the long sleeves. <laughs> yes, yes. That. But uh, always, like you know, I found that so when we we we're talking about the best, I mean, the best for for this situation, the best for you know. Uh, like sometimes we need to understand that the best it not means hundred percent because we really don't know what hundred percent is, and design right. right and design it's a process. So today we do this, tomorrow we do something different, and we grow it. So it's always like growth, and that's I like mm-hmm. your, uh, you know, approach of uh, the step by step, like transformation process and and growth and uh, and and. and do be the best, but not the best like that you feel like uncomfortable because you don't know how best you are, right? Right. And And I think eudaimonia talks about that, right? And I don't mean to interrupt you. I just, I really liked some of the things that I was reading about the continuum. And, you know, when even being your best self, it doesn't mean that you're being perfect. It's embracing the good, the bad, the ugly that comes with being human sometimes and embracing your vulnerability, your humility, But, you know, doing that in a way that is comfortable for you and then, you know, understanding that today may not be as productive as tomorrow, you know, but you are curating a space where you can be not necessarily always your best perfect self, but, you know, when you're thinking more about what's your authentic self, which is, you know, such a popular phrase nowadays, but I think that's really important. And 
it comes into, into play certainly so much of this working from home emphasis when you not only are just, you know, enjoying your home and relaxing at home, you are living, working, playing at home. And so you need a space that enables you to do that or even zoned spaces that let you do that. Like I try to, you know, allocate my home office where I am now differently than some other aspects of my home, knowing how I need to function in that space. And there are ways that you can encourage that and do behavioral nudges with, you know, natural space design. And so it's just maybe keeping some of those things in mind and understanding there's environmental psychology that comes into play. And there are things that your body craves physiologically and responds to really well. And then of course, your, your individual inclinations as well. And I do different advisory work on neurodiversity design. And of course, everybody you could argue is neurodiverse because we're all different, but I found that I'm sensory sensitive. And over the years, that's helped me inform the neurodiverse design that I do because I do get migraines from too much sun. And in Australia, that can be a problem because there's a lot of sun here. But, um, you know, it's just understanding that people are different, understanding that, you know, I individually, I'm different. My participants are different people I work with as clients and having everybody acknowledge that up front, especially when you're thinking about profits for a business. If I'm advising an owner operator or just somebody who's a tenant and, you know, they're trying to make their business be profitable, it's understanding it's not just about the money. It's about making sure that you're doing the best you can for, you know, all these other different pieces and especially your people and your people have a huge piece in that puzzle and play a big part. Um, design, like, you know, of environment means a lot because like, for example, we have now like uh, new cafes opened after this COVID. And uh, when I go there, it's not just like a coffee, like tasty coffee, but sometimes I like the colors. I like some cushions, cushions. I like some, like, you know, uh, like uh, the presentation of like some pictures, some paintings, some whatever, and smile of the person mm-hmm. who serves me, right? And then definitely I would like to go to this cafe again, even if it's not extremely fancy, even if the menu is not like huge, right? But, uh, or for example, we like to go to bakery every Saturday because it's always fresh bread and buns, so fresh and fresh coffee, you know? So this is amazing. Yes. And um, they don't have like something on the wall, like too much or whatever, but the freshness mm-hmm. and the smile, and you know, it's made with love. It's actually makes our our day like very good, like with feelings. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it's probably not perfect, but for you, it's a perfect beginning of your Saturday, for example, right? Like my Saturday, just all yes. said, oh, it was, it was marvelous, right? And that's what we do. Like we not necessary to follow some kind of instruction to bring everything to perfection. And I really would like to talk about perfection with one of my uh, other guests. And also I like, you know, I like that you wrote um, uh, in your description of the work, uh, the phrase uh, that um, triple bottom line about triple mm. bottom line so i would like you to explain more because i uh, as i understand it's probably what you were mentioned already the three direction of work or maybe something different yeah so triple bottom line is interesting it's been a term that's been bending it about the past few years in particular but um it oftentimes relates to pe- people profit and planet. Oh. And I quite like it because it's three it's, sorry for three P, 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 P. Yeah, trip, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you think about that, it's triple bottom line, people profit planet. Um, people naturally think of profit, of course. That's what I was alluding to earlier with the companies. Yes. And it's interesting that that was always the emphasis for so long. And some people who I think do profit well as a business their mission and vision and values oftentimes include their people inherently if they're doing what they do well. And if they have Mm -hmm. that mission really driven into the purpose, meaning behind a company. And so people oftentimes means, you know, not just your board members, it's your stakeholders. So the people who you employ, it's the people that you're your created product or your services impact. And that could also mean downstream impact. So if you're thinking about ESG, which is a really common thing right now, when you think about 
environment, social, and governance, which is a way that a lot of companies are being assessed at this point in time. That includes that social element in the heart. People oftentimes think the S is for sustainability, but it's for social. And so understanding, again, the role of people there and then, you know, the different aftermath that some of the products that your company or your, your business produces and brings. So there's that with people, but then the planet aspect too, that sustainability piece is so key. And in my business with built environment, built environment contributes about 40% of emissions. And so when I heard that 10 years ago, when I was doing my master's, in sustainability, it just made so much sense to focus on how you can make built environments use less energy, whether they were newly constructed or retrofitted. How can you do that? And oftentimes the answer that people were coming up with is, well, you can design them so they require less energy. You know, it's very simple things that ancestors did and, you know, indigenous designers would do all the time, which was you take into account the orientation of the building. So you don't have too much sun coming in and you yeah. don't have that glare, that thermal load that you then have to condition your space for. And then you don't necessarily need that air conditioning. You can use passive ventilation and architectural science strategies. But then if you look more at other ways, a lot of people also understood as I did that the occupants, the people were really how you could compound the impact and engaging people to open their windows so that you have that feedback loop. And you're again, thinking about all those connections. So in my case, the triple bottom line with the people profit planet comes into play very realistically and concretely with my work. When you think about the people, the buildings, the technology and the interplay. And another thing that's come up as a glue to my work has been when you think about eudaimonia and you think about positive psychology, when people are their best selves, oftentimes they get into this altruistic mindset. They want to be able to help their neighbor. They want to contribute to society inherently, intrinsically. And there's great work. I think Frank Martella does a lot of fantastic work in this space. And I've really enjoyed reading some of his things and seeing those interconnections, because that's something that also came out non-intentionally with my PhD work. It was seeing people want to make things better for their spaces, make things better for their grandchildren. And when you think about that, it was really interesting to see that the triple bottom line almost became something that they were thinking about, not necessarily the profit, of course, because they weren't businesses, they were people living at home, but it was nice to see it organically come up that there was this people to planet connection. And I think if companies emphasize that more and really drove that home in their mission, their purpose, their meaning, that's something that would hopefully just have benefits to follow. And then they would be able to see that impact in their work and their business and then, then their people, which would again feed back into the business success. So that's why oftentimes I say I design for people's or the best selves or flourishing well-being of people, businesses, or organizations and the planet, because together that allows you to impact all three aspects of the triple bottom line. Uh, it has a logic because, you know, if you want to, if you don't live like on an abandoned, uh, deserted island or in some kind of like, you know, rural area, and uh, if you live in society, you deal with people, of course, you need to make some profit because you can exchange this money for other stuff you can use, and you're dealing with people, and then if you want to live like longer, then you have to plan your life, plan what you have to do according to season, whatever. So it's always like, you know, has a logic that we are not alone. And um, even like if you live alone, still you need to think how to survive. Depending on people, not depending on the people, but still you have to survive. Again, you need to use some materials and you need to get this knowledge how to get this materials and build the house or build whatever. So it's always like about like cleaving that because we are not made to be alone, like, you know, just like one person somewhere. And then we have two people. It's already like two people. When we have three people, it's a group. And when they have more than it's a population, right? 
Yes. And and uh, so it it makes logic in any environment, like in small uh, amount, like small amount of people or big amount of like people does matter in in uh, in some business or an entire country or on a planet where we live together. And uh, it's all affect us. It's all affect each other's. Yeah, there's so much interest, especially environmental psychology. That's something yes. that when I was thinking about making my change 10 years ago to architecture, I picked up of all things a financial times when I was in Europe. And it's not something that I normally read, but in their house and home section, it talked about environmental psychology and how marketing, ex marketing researchers were finding that if you look at a bank design, oh, that yeah. people oftentimes have banks with high ceilings in older buildings so that people would have lofty ambitions to borrow more money. Yeah. And you just start thinking yeah. about the parallels and then, you know, the similar with churches, you have these high ceilings, open air elements, you know, windows, things like that to make you feel closer to God or whoever you believe in. And all those different pieces, it's so fascinating to see, like you said, how people just inherently had these understandings hundreds of years ago yes and how sometimes we're almost coming back to that understanding now and perhaps you know scientifically proving it in a means that we understand now and getting that concrete evidence to say oh yes there is a connection for the neural arts there is meaning behind having a bridged approach rather than only a deep approach you need that breath in addition to that depth and that's really what I try to bring to my consulting and my work is so that I can have the depth and breath. I can connect to the engineers, the architects, the business people, speak in the language that they understand, work together on a common solution and know that it's not just me coming up with a perfect solution. It's them owning it. And that, again, the eudaimonic design approach or having intentional, meaningful co-design done together. Hopefully that's something that they want to see succeed. And therefore they put their effort into and then, you know, create something at the end that they're proud of and they want to continue on even when I leave and move on to my next project. To me, that's when there's success, you know, they don't necessarily need me anymore. And, and that's you. transformation, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this interesting conversation. And at mm -hmm. the end, usually I ask uh, my guests to say some key key like messages or points like you know uh short one if, if you have such uh to our viewers because the time is running and we have to yes. finish our podcast but again it's like we can talk about this environment psychology all as well like a lot because you know it's a new direction and uh, again it's uh, a lot of new even like um it was it was interesting. There was a reading about the studies about the color of walls in a, a hospitals. Why they change the color? How they kind of start start learning how the color of the wall uh, reflects on uh, people's health and especially mm -hmm. process of recovery. You know, and many yes. other interesting studies about the architecture places where we go. Quite often, it's like schools and, like you said, banks and and mm -hmm. uh, hospitals right and many other places we spend time from time to time or quite often depends on us right so tell us more uh like tell, give us some key key points from from sure. the conversation we had yeah so i would say a couple of key takeaways would be that last thing that we were talking about is Embracing the value of different approaches. I think so many times people get stuck in their specialty and they're quite happy to remain there. But I think it's important to show that you can learn things from each other and being able to respectfully agree, disagree, share, and know that you can inform your approach, your practice by learning about other people. So being open-minded and having a multidisciplinary approach, to me, that's something I'm constantly pushing and also emphasizing how there needs to be a bridge between academia and industry. Um, so often it's important to apply the research from academia, but then it's also really important to have, you know, industry feedback, feedback into academia. So I think just bridging in general is so important. So I would definitely offer that up as one piece. 
And then secondarily, I think just also pushing forth that idea of meaningful, putting meaning behind design. Because oftentimes designers, you know, they create beautiful things and it's based on, you know, science, their work, their experience, but it's so important to involve the people and making sure that that's done meaningfully and, you know, with an ethics of care. And that's something I've learned more about from an academic theory-based perspective, but you know, making sure that co-design isn't just this buzzword that so many people use nowadays. It's making sure that you're really working with your people in a way that they feel engaged, they feel involved, and they feel like that output is theirs to own and make succeed. So I would emphasize that idea of co-design. And then one thing that I learned also with the PhD is that if you design meaningfully with especially older people or people who are on the edges as edge demographics, that's a means to inclusively design for other demographics. And so often, ironically, those groups are left out of the design process. But if you were to think about it strategically, it makes sense to design with them. And so by designing with them, you inclusively design for a variety of people. And so I definitely would suggest doing more inclusive design too, not just designing for the quote unquote average, making sure that you're really allowing for good experiences for everybody so that all people can experience that transformative design in the spaces they inhabit and be their best selves, getting to that idea of eudaimonia. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I really enjoy yes. our conversation and I hope our viewers will enjoy as well. And if you need more information about Jenna, please uh, scroll down the video to information about the video and you'll find all links to her web page, social page. And uh, you can contact Jenna whenever you want and uh, ask her more questions. And I hope yes, we'll yes. meet again. We'll probably will do some other podcasts. Thank you. Yes. Have a lovely okay. evening. Okay. <laughs> yes.